Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our class. Uh, my name is Lyndall Ormsby. Uh, I think I know most people, but if I've not met you, uh, I've been at Buck Run. We've been at Buck Run. Susan and my, my wife and I have been here about 10 years, close to 10 years. And uh, I'm a professor at the University of Kentucky. I've been there for 40 years and uh, have seen a lot of change, uh, really, in students. And uh, I've been able to teach millennials, Gen Z, Gen X, and so on. And so I'm going to share some of my observations about that whole, whole process. Uh, I also currently serve as one of your deacons. And uh, we also coordinate a, a community group in Lexington. Uh, so if you're in Lexington and you haven't found a community group, uh, well, we'd love to invite you to join ours. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, when you came in, there were some materials at the back of the table. I should have those for you each week. Uh, one of those was just an outline of the course. Uh, the other was a packet that had a couple of things. One was a little survey. Uh, I actually had a separate copy of that laid out. If you can try to fill that out and drop that in the, the blue box back there before you leave, that gives me some feedback on where people are relative to their uh, beliefs and issues that they may be dealing with with regard to uh, friends, family members, and so on. There's also a copy of uh, some PowerPoint presentations uh, that'll be going through some slides. And also there's another packet that has some fill in the blanks. Uh, some people like filling in the blanks. So if you're a uh, that type of learner, you've got that. If you're a visual learner, there's the PowerPoint slides. Uh, Normally what I recommend is to take the, uh, just just um, relax and listen through the presentation and uh, you've got the slides when you go home this week, take the fill in the blank form and kind of go back through that and review notes for the next week that kind of helps to reinforce some of the, the things that we'll be talking about. Uh, I also have a, uh, a roll I'm supposed to send around. Uh, so if you could put your name on that. Also, I've got a separate list uh, for your name and your email. If you'd like to get some supplemental materials, I've got a lot of things I typically send out during the week. So if you'd like to receive those materials, and I can also send out uh, each week, I'll send you an advanced copy of the slide so you can be looking ahead uh, for those materials as well. So any questions on that, on the logistics? All right, let me go ahead and, and cir circulate those around. There, John. All right, I think I've got all the logistics taken care of. So the title of this course is called Reaching Lost Sheep, or Why, Why People Are Walking Away from the Church and Christianity and How We Can Reach Them. Uh, that latter statement might be somewhat uh, confusing or a shock to some folks, but as we'll see statistically, there's a huge phenomenon going on in our country right now. And so we want to spend some time this week looking at what is going on, why is this happening, and how as we as a church, both collectively and individually, can respond to that. Uh, you, if you're like me, you may have some family members or friends, uh, a good friends of yours that, that may have walked away from the church, have stopped attending church, or have even said they're no longer Christians. And so we want to kind of look at some of the reasons what's going on for that and, uh, and how we can, again, be more effective in, in reaching folks. So. Uh, before we get started, though, let's open with a word of prayer, okay? Dear God, just thank you for this uh, beautiful day that you've given us. Uh, Lord, we, we come to, to this Sunday, many of us with a heavy heart, Lord, that we may have uh, friends and family that uh, we care deeply about that have, uh, have, have walked away from you, Lord. Uh, Lord, help us to, uh, in this class, hopefully better understand what's happening, both uh, individually uh, with them and, and culturally, uh, and how we can be more strategic in reaching them, uh, how we can uh, personally realign the way that um, we, inter we interact with folks, how we can be more effective in uh, reflecting uh, your love to them, Lord, uh, and then ask that your Holy Spirit just work in their hearts, that you might draw them back to you, Lord, and that uh, we might uh, truly reflect uh, the treasure that you are to those around us. So just be with us in this course that we might... Uh, uh, Lord, just affect our minds, be um, uh, better educated about what's happening, how we can be more effective. Lord, just ask you to uh, touch our hearts, give us a new burden for those that uh, are lost, that need you, and uh, Lord, help 
help that uh, burden motivate us to uh, make changes in our own life, uh, the way we interact with folks, uh, to be tools in your hands to draw them back to you. So again, just be with us today, Lord, and uh, ask that you just uh, speak through me as we look at some of these, uh, in some cases, disturbing statistics, but more importantly, uh, just look to your word, Lord, for a source of strength and encouragement uh, and power as we as we seek to live for you in this uh, this disturbing world. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, again, I gave you that little survey to fill out. If you have a chance to uh, do that before you leave today and put it in the, the blue box, that gives me a little sense of uh, where people are with regard to this issue. If you have uh, friends or family maybe that have uh, left their faith, I know a lot of folks I interact with, uh, uh, they've got uh, children, uh, at, at least my generation of, of folks that are leaving Christianity. I've got a lot of folks at Southern Seminary, even professors, this is happening with. So it, it's really cutting across a large swath of uh, the church today. Uh, but first, we'll kind of look at what, what are we trying to do? I mean, in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus t- tells us the parable of the lost sheep, something I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, and Jesus talks about the fact that we have a responsibility to go and reach those individuals that have wandered off from the from the flock, so to speak, and try to rescue them and bring them back to the fold. So that's kind of our motivation behind this course, that passage in Luke. Uh, specifically for our course, we have three different sets of objectives. One is dealing with our mind, the other is dealing with the heart, and the other is dealing with our will. Uh, so our cognitive objectives are really to try to understand why people are leaving the church in Christianity and to uh, give us some resources to uh, better minister to those folks. Uh, From an effective objective, trying to focus on our heart, how we can increase our motivation to remain steadfast in our faith and deepen our desire, our own desire to follow Jesus, uh, also to increase our motivation to share the gospel. I run into a lot of people today that feel very intimidated, uh, just given the cultural uh, backdrop of our country. Uh, So how can we be better motivated to, to basically step out uh, and and uh, spread spread the good news. And then behaviorally, what are some practical things we can do to strengthen our faith and our own desire uh, and to be, remain faithful in following Jesus and then finally to be more effective in reaching lost sheep. So the overall course, some of the topics we're going to look at, today we're going to look at trying to understand the challenge of something called faith deconstruction. Has anyone heard that term before? Just out of curiosity. All right, so we're going to try to look at what is that. What does that mean? Uh, We're going to also look at understanding really the nature of that. What are some of the characteristics of that? Uh, In lesson three, we'll kind of do a deep dive into what do we mean by faith? How is faith different from certainty? Uh, What do we mean by doubt and disbelief? How are all these interrelated? Uh, And in the context of of people that are struggling with their faith, how does this dynamic play out? So we're trying to sort of do a diagnostic analysis of that. Um, And then lesson four, uh, we're going to look at 12 potential strategies for proclaiming the gospel really in a postmodern world. Are there some strategic things we can do uh, as evangelical churches to be more effective in communicating the gospel in the context of our culture? Uh, Lesson five, we'll look at sort of a new, uh, new way to look at apologetics. It used to be uh, 30 or 40 years ago, apologetics were basically based on trying to present information that would convince people of Christianity being true. That's really not where the battlefield is right now. I mean, that's still an issue, but today uh, the, the real challenge you run into people uh, basically say that, well, Christianity is no longer good or it's no longer beautiful, and that's really the, the, the battleground of which a lot of this dynamic is playing out. So we'll look at how that shift has occurred and how we can be more effective in communicating the gospel in this sort of new domain that we're, we're dealing with. And then finally, we'll look at some ways to be more effective in sharing the, the gospel message. Uh, that's going to involve learning how to listen better uh, and also how to a- ask effective uh, penetrating questions to try to understand exactly where people are so we can be more effective uh, in speaking the gospel specifically where they, where they have a need. Uh, so this first lesson, we're going to kind of look at some of the uh, present accelerating apostasy in America with regard to Christianity. What are some of the recent causes for people leaving the church? We'll then step back and sort of look at a biblical perspective. This is really not a new phenomenon if you go and look at the New Testament. 
uh, people were leaving Jesus back in the Gospels. Uh, Paul was constantly talking about people that were falling away from the faith. And so we want to kind of give uh, a perspective on that. We'll then look at some of the demographics of the lost sheep. Uh, when we talk about lost sheep, they're not all the same. They have different characteristics. So if we're going to be effective in reaching a specific person, we need to understand kind of where they are on this spectrum of, of lostness, so to speak. Um, uh, we'll then kind of look at the whole concept of faith deconstruction, try to explain what that is, uh, and then more uh, focus sort of on our own sort of uh, uh, a tribe. What, what, what does evangelical deconstruction look like? How is that different? And uh, some of the things that are emerging in that domain. We'll then look at some uh, consequences of faith deconstruction and then finally sort of finish up with a, a biblical response or mandate for going forward. Okay. Any questions on that before we continue? Okay, so let's look at sort of this, what I call the present and coming crisis. We're already sort of in a crisis in the evangelical community in America, and it's, it's, things are likely, if statistics hold true, going to get worse. Uh, first, I might step back and think about just church attendance in America. Uh, a lot of people have this misconception that, you know, everybody went to church in America. That's really not really true if you go back and look at the foundation of America probably 10 to 15 percent of the people were going to church now part of that's because of just the rural nature of America a lot of people lived out on farms and stuff they're really not churches you, you couldn't just hop in your car and drive 30 minutes to get to a church okay so uh, so that's part of it but uh, we had two significant spiritual events in the history of America the first was called the Great Awakening and then the second one uh, was the second Great Awakening where there were a lot of revivals and so on and that kind of uh, triggered the increase of church membership uh, following the Civil War uh, it's estimated that religious attendance grew from about 34 percent to 49 percent and then after World War II it's been pretty stable around 50 percent uh, of people in America regularly would go to church uh, that's changing, however, if you look since uh, about 2009, you see this sort of 40-45% threshold. Since 2009, there's been a steady decrease in church attendance in America. It's now down to about 30%. So it's estimated in the United States over the last 15 years, about 40 million people have stopped going to church. Okay, That's a staggering number when you think about it. Okay. Uh, that's from 50% almost down to 25%. So something's obviously going on here. Uh, if we look at just church membership, church membership back even from the uh, 50s was probably pretty constant around 70, 75%. Uh, again, around 2000 here, we've seen a steady drop in church membership where it's now below 50%. So less than 50% of Americans belong to a church. Okay. So again, we're seeing a, a significant drop off in that statistics. If we look at Southern Baptists, we might say, well, we're immune to that. You know, I've heard Southern Baptists are, has been growing for decades. Uh, that's not so much true. The last uh, couple of decades since 2006, uh, Southern Baptists peaked at about 16 million since that time. Uh, we've, we've lost about 20% of the membership in the Southern Baptist uh, denomination, about 3 million people, okay? So, again, something is happening here, uh, and I, I'm sure we, we run into people that are no longer going to church, like what was happening. I mean, so these are some fairly st staggering statistics. Part of that relates to the fact that people no longer really have confidence institutionally in our country about organized religion or the church. Uh, here's a survey that was done by Gallup going back to the 70s, what percent of the population had confidence in the church as, a, as an organized institution. You can see it's just been a steady drop since that time all the way down to the present, okay? Uh, what's significant, if you look at after 9-11, you have a huge drop in confidence, and we see a little bit, again, of a drop after the COVID epidemic. Uh, we, we could go in and talk about some reasons why, potentially, but, but that's an observation that you, could, you can see as well. So what are some recent causes for people leaving the church? One of these was the end of the Cold War. Uh, I think culturally, at least in America, people looked to uh, 
God for protection against those horrible Soviets. And uh, after the end of the Cold War, it's like, well, we don't need God anymore. We're okay. Uh, we've gotten rid of the Soviets on our own. So that's part of it. Uh, uh, you, you may not know, in 56, the, the national model was actually out of one mini, or out of mini one, rather. Yeah, that's probably true today, the latter. But anyway, uh, it was replaced within God We Trust. Again, that was trying to focus the attention of our, of our population to, to our need for God. Uh, there's also been a loss of general cultural identity and, and, and moral framework associated with Christianity in our country. We're all familiar with a series of Supreme Court decisions that have continued to enroll a biblical uh, ethic in our country. There's obviously changing cultural perspectives on moral issues. Uh, this third one I think is interesting, just the rise of children's sports leagues. Uh, a lot of people no longer take their kids to Sunday school because they've got soccer games and things like that. And uh, that's starting to, I think, erode some of this current generation, as we'll see statistically a little bit. Um, uh, just the association of uh, evangelicalism with conservative politics, at least that's the perspection, perspective of a lot of the population, and so some people have been turned off from that. Uh, we, we all recognize the COVID crisis has impacted uh, church attendance. A lot of people that were coming to church before COVID uh, no longer attend, either out of just uh, concerns about their physical health, uh, or if they've just got into other habits that they're pursuing other interests and they've, they've kind of fallen off from that perspective, okay? And of course, we've had a lot of church compromises over the last uh, several decades, uh, just different movements that have uh, kind of appeared on the scene that I think have kind of undermined uh, some of the uh, validity of our, our Christian witness. Uh, and then uh, if, if you followed some of the evangelical community. There's been a, lots of different divisions of different denominations since 1973. The Presbyterian Church split into sort of the conservative and liberal branches. Uh, the same thing happened with the Southern Baptist Convention in 91 with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship breaking away. Uh, the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church have both uh, gone in, through significant splits. Uh, and so this has also caused, I think, some Confusion amongst the general population is like, well, what's wrong with all these these Christians? They can't get along, or why are these these more crazy Christians that, that still are against homosexuality and things like that? Why can't they see that that's uh, they're not on the right side of history? You hear that phrase all the time. Um, so those are some other reasons. Uh, and then uh, being more introspective, there's been lots of church scandals that people point to. It's like I just don't want to be associated with that stuff anymore. Uh, there's been some, uh, obviously, uh, church abuse scandals. Uh, there's been scandals in, in the Protestant denomination. Even the SBC has had some scandals that I think most people are aware with. Uh, we also now have sort of the rise, what I would say, this seduction addition of the Internet and social media. There's all kinds of new things that are basically pulling people's attention and uh, focus away from, from uh, the church. Uh, there's been a rise of biblical and doctrinal literacy. Most people don't know what they believe or why they believe it. Um, and there's been, as a consequence, a rise of biblical skepticism. Uh, the assertion that Christianity isn't true. Uh, that used to be really kind of the issue that, that we dealt with, say, 20, 30 years ago. Now it's not so much skepticism, it's more cynicism. It's just, well, Christianity is neither good or beautiful, so I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, that's what I run into a lot of students on campus, that's their, their perspective. Relative to doctoral literacy, this was a survey done <clears throat> in 2022 by Lifeway, uh, and they surveyed quote unquote US evangelicals, and they found that 38% felt that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion, and it's not about subjective truth, okay? So th this is evangelical, supposedly, okay? 43% uh, thought that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God, that's almost half Okay, and 56% believe that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. All right, so uh, if that's what evangelicals believe, you can imagine what uh, some of the other denominations believe. So it's no wonder we're seeing people walking away from the church or Christianity if this is what they're believing. Uh, so that, that's, that's a, some extremely shocking statistics, I think. 
All right, so uh, with that kind of uh, initial barrage, let's take just a, a few minutes, just get, uh, get, uh, get with a couple people around you, and I want you to answer these three questions together, all right? They're also in the back of your packet. I think I got the list of questions, but so what's your initial reaction to these kind of statistics? Do you personally know anyone who's, who's uh, left the church recently? And why do you think they've stopped attending, all right? So I'll give you a few minutes, uh, just get with your neighbor and uh, discuss those three questions and then we'll get back together. I know we could talk about this for a, quite a while, but let me try to uh, bring you back. Uh, so what was your initial reaction to those uh, statistics? Were you aware it was, was quote unquote that bad? Okay. That this they are, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, and in Asia. Wendell, do you know if those were, like, is it self-identified? Uh, we were just talking about that. Uh, I think it was, which, you know, that could be a cultural issue, and that may be explaining why we've lost 40 million people, because they're kind of people believing that, right? So, um, but uh, regardless, <laughs> it's still pretty shocking. Um, so. It makes me wonder if all the questions were asked. You know, sure. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. So uh, how many people just personally uh, have a family member, uh, either immediate or extended, uh, that have either walked away from the church or uh, that no longer profess to be a Christian? Just show a hand. Okay. I mean, that's over half of y'all. Okay. Uh, so that's obviously impacting a lot of us. Uh, why do you, what, what's some of the reactions you've had in, in interacting with friends and family why they've stopped going to church? COVID was a big problem. It was? And so people got comfortable with watching it on TV or social media. Uh-huh. They decided, well, I'm going to the body. Okay. As far as the building. Because the building, Christ is not solely the building. Right. Right. You, know, you don't have to have a building. And so that mentality is helpful because once you understand what Christ wants of us and where we're supposed to be going, you know, you don't always need the building. But it's good to have the fellowship within the building too. Right. Right. Well, it, and it depends how we're going to find church, right? Church could be a building or it could be just total association with any body of Christ, right? I think some of that's people. Yes. Um, I think you know, for me personally, one thing that I struggle with is what I see like relationally with people that I know versus what is taught. Uh-huh. So like I have friends who are lesbians. I have friends who are gay. I have friends who are pagan. I have friends who are atheists. And so then them as people, right? Relating that to saying, well, the Bible says, you know, this about those situations and understanding how to put those two things together. Uh huh. And that can be difficult, right? Okay. Yes. I, I think that there's a, a real um, influence of this, you know, rugged individualism of, of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The American and, way. And I, yes. think that, <laughs> I think the church has really, uh, unfortunately, let that twist into. Yeah. And so I mean, I've known people that were that were good. I thought brothers in Christ, and you know, in the Navy, they're like, you know, I, I, I feel closer to God when I'm surfing on a Sunday morning. Right. Or I feel closer to God when I'm, you know, on a beautiful golf course on mm -hmm. Sunday morning. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's that's great, but that's not really the idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think you you, you touched on a point that's significant. It, just in America, we're all no one's going to tell me what to do, right? Yeah. When I was a kid, the tent revivals or week long revivals, I mean, you know, that was really strong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Bible, we studied in the King James when I was a kid, and the King James Bible version had a little more bite to it. Mm -hmm. Some of the versions that I've seen come out have taken a little of the sting out of the, out of the truth. Right.
Right. Yeah. Even with my own daughter. I mean, I think her appeal yeah. from seizures eight years ago thought she would never go attend any school, be able to drive, be able to do anything. She's a senior in college now, but God took her. Right. He took the seizures away from her. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I took her in front of the church and had hands laid on her. You know, and a lot of people don't believe that. Okay. One last question. My sister and brother in law left the church because of people in the church. Uh huh. Um, either not letting them spend a lot of day with the life they can or um, not having a place, you know, finding a place to belong. To uh huh. All right, so I apologize for to keep going if we're not going to get done, but so let's first look at a biblical perspective. So as I already alluded to when I, my opening comments, this is not necessarily a new phenomenon, right? Uh, we've seen all kinds of biblical examples of different groups that, that basically walked away from Jesus, uh, even in his ministry, and this is Jesus we're talking about, right? So, uh, so that's, that's something that, that has happened. Uh, if you look at Second Timothy in particular, Paul's talking about all the different folks uh, that are walking away from the faith or have left the faith. He actually uh, singles out three different individuals in that, in that book, talking about people that have lost, lost the faith. Uh, and then Jesus has prophecies that this is going to happen. All right, So we shouldn't be shocked that, that people uh, are doing this. Uh, he said, you know, looking to the future, there'll, there'll come a time when many false prophets will rise and lead many astray. And uh, another passage you're probably familiar with, again, out of Second Timothy, for the time is coming where people will not endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into mist. Does that kind of sound like something out of the front page today? It does, doesn't it? Okay. And there's some additional passages and then Jesus gave several different parables about people rejecting uh, the truth. Uh, you think of the, the parable of the sower, where Jesus was spreading uh, the sower sowing truth, and different different groups of people. Some of them accepted the truth initially, right? And then uh, a tribulation came or something, so they walked away from it, or they had a poor foundation. Uh, so there's examples of that. And then we have the parable of the wheat and the tares, uh, where there's a farmer sowing wheat, and then he comes up and finds there's all these tares have been mixed in. And then he asks uh, the workers, say, should we go out and, and yank out the tares? And he says, no, leave those there because you might uproot some of the wheat. So we have to recognize within churches, within the evangelical community, there's, there's, there are tares there that, that are not true Christians. Uh, and so when some of those are leaving, it doesn't mean, necessarily mean that true Christians are walking away, we have a lot of folks that, that uh, are professing to believe Christ but really don't, don't hold true to the gospel. And then finally, looking at the end, end of all this, Jesus gives the parable of the sheep and the goats. That, that we, we think some people are sheep, but they're actually goats, and there's going to be a separation on Judgment Day uh, between those two. Okay. So one of the things I think is important is to recognize that this is, this is spiritual warfare we're observing, okay? Uh, I love this quote by an author uh, by the name of John Eldred. who says, until we come to terms with war as the context of our days, we will not understand life. We will mis misinterpret 90% of what is happening to us and around us. You won't understand your life if you don't see clearly what's happening and how to live forward from here unless you see it as a battle, a battle against our hearts. Satan is waging an all-out war against the church and Christians, certainly in America today, I think. And we need to recognize there's a, there's a huge spiritual war going on, and I think a lot of Christians are just kind of oblivious to that, kind of sort of sleepwalking through their lives, and that's something we need to be attuned to if we're going to be effective in, in reaching people that, that are being held captive by that. And we see this uh, from Scripture in Ephesians. Paul talks about the fact that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we're admonished to take up 
the full armor of God that he outlines uh, in Ephesians 6. And the reason to do that is so that we're able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so when we look at people that are being pulled away from the faith, there are several strategies or schemes that Satan uses. Uh, first, he deceives people. Uh, we see massive deception going on in our country today, don't we? Uh, he then blinds people to the truth so they can't see the truth. Uh, the next step is he takes people captive. And we know a lot of people we see that are, that are in captivity. They don't, they don't recognize it because they're blind. And then ultimately, once he takes people captive, he devours them. Okay, uh, and That's a sobering reality. And so we need to think about, as we're trying to reach people, we're trying to save them from captivity. And ultimately, they're going to be devoured. Uh, so that should motivate us uh, to get serious about how we can effectively reach folks. Okay. So some of the demographics of, of lost sheep, if we look at some of the characteristics of people that uh, are leaving the church, uh, I've kind of broken this down into four different categories. I call that uh, consumer sheep, casual sheep, cognitive sheep, and cultural sheep. Okay. So the first category is consumer sheep. These are folks that uh, I wouldn't necessarily say have, have rejected Christianity. They've just got distracted and busy with other things. They, they may be the person that, that was going to church, but now they've got their kids involved in sports leagues and things like that. And pretty soon, uh, the, the church just no longer becomes relevant to what their needs are. Uh, or they go to churches to try to get their specific needs met, and they don't like something, so they decide they keep hopping from church to church to trying to find a better church that's going to basically serve or meet their, their consumer needs, so to speak. So I think some of these folks, or probably a lot of them, would come back to church if we just basically make a, a concerted effort to try to invite them back. Uh, statistically, folks in this, this group have found that just asking someone to come to church or come back to church many times will be effective if you can start just building a relationship and trying to encourage them to come back into church, all right? Uh, the next group, though, typically uh, is characteristic of some of the folks that have actually left the church and even left Christianity. And the first group I would characterize as sort of casually sheep. These are people that have been either hurt by his experiences in the church uh, or they've been, they've been wounded by experiences of life, and they just don't see that the church has really helped them. Uh, they don't see that the church has been beneficial to them. And so they typically then kind of end up in the conclusion, well, Christianity is really not good. Uh, because it's not helping me or it's caused me damage, and so they, they walked away from the faith because of that reason. Uh, then we have what I call cognitive sheep. These are folks whose Christianity is basically in their heads and not in their hearts, and so they were taught certain things uh, that if you believe this, this is what Christianity is, and so a lot of these kids, uh, my experience interacting with folks at UK, they come to college, they're bombarded with all these, these uh, conflicting things that they've been taught. They're now in a struggle, and they, they basically conclude, well, I was, I was told a bunch of things that aren't true, and so I can't trust Christianity, so Christianity is not true. That's the conclusion they, they end up coming with. And then finally, we have what I call, call cultural uh, sheep. These are folks that uh, have got embedded in the culture, they're kind of being seduced by the culture, or they have relationships with people in the culture that, whose lifestyles or perspectives are radically different from Christianity, and that creates a crisis. Uh, and it's like, do I, do I reject my friend, or I, I reject uh, this bigoted church? And then the, the choice becomes to basically reject what they perceive as, as this bigoted, hurtful church. And so they've concluded that, that Christianity is not beautiful, all right? And that's one of the driving motivations for them leaving the church. So when we look at that, those th four characteristics, typically these folks are a little easier to get to or reach. A lot of times we can just be more um, direct and intentional about trying to get them back involved in the church. Uh, these other folks here, we're dealing with more significant uh, issues, and this is typically the, gr the group that is, being, is going through faith deconstruction. All right, By that I mean, as we'll see, they're basically walking away from Christianity because they don't think it's true or good or beautiful, okay? And that suggests later on uh, a possible apologetic as we start looking to people, how do we reach them with the gospel? 
And, and each of those cases, we're typically having to overcome one of those barriers that they've erected. Uh, we have to show them that, that Christianity is, in fact, beautiful, that it is, in fact, good, that it is, in fact, true. In many cases, it's in that order, not the first order. Okay. All right, so here's a few more statistics just to, uh, if I haven't alarmed you enough. Uh, so in the last 50 years, uh, the percentage of professing Christians in America has fallen from 90% to 60%. Okay. Uh, this is coming from Pew. At the same time, about... The number of religiously unaffiliated folks in America has risen from 5% to 30%. And if these trends continue unabated, and they could change, obviously, we hope the Lord can, can intervene with a revival in America, uh, then it's estimated by about 2052 that the number of religious unaffiliated folks in America will exceed the number of, of Christians, all right? So th these, are the, these are the statistics we're looking at right now with these projections. That's what we could be looking at. So what's happening here? It's fascinating if you look at uh, projected change due to religious switching, that is, someone's in one religion and they switch to another or a non-religious group. Uh, most of the projected losses are going to be coming out of the Christian community, all right? Although it's already was talked about, there is a growth a net growth in Christianity around the world, a lot of it's occurring in Asia and Africa, uh, but uh, there's also a net loss occurring in the U.S. Uh, but it's interesting that most of the folks that are leaving these, these groups are coming from the Christian cohort and are moving over to the unaffiliated cohort. Uh, another interesting thing is to look at how this has changed um, relative to generations. If you look uh, of those that share a religious affiliation, uh, from the silent generation, those born between 25 to 45, only about 18% of those have no religious affiliation. Uh, whereas if you're looking at Generation Z, most recent statistics, almost half of Generation Z has no religious affiliation right now. Okay, And so you can obviously see the generational impact uh, of this trend over these different data sets. Uh, another interesting statistic is looking at uh, those that share believing in God without a doubt. And so it's fascinating. Generation X has stayed per pretty much consistent with the boomer and the silent generation, but with the millennials, we've seen a significant drop off. And with Generation Z, it's just it's really dropping off precipitously. Okay, So that now 55% of millennials have doubts about God's existence, uh, and 70% of Generation Z have doubts about God's existence, right? It's like, what in the world is happening in America, right? Well, part of this, I think, is coming from our school system, okay? Uh, and, and we're just seeing the, the net results of that. Now, this, this has significance not only for just the people that are walking away from the church, but it's also a massive impacts on mental health. This is now a mental health issues in Generation Z and the, and the uh, Millennials is now a crisis. Uh, at UK, uh, I have students come to me all the time that breaking down in tears because they're anxious or depressed. Uh, UK has over doubled their counseling program of, of counselors they've hired to deal with the massive crisis. So there's a direct correlation between people basically losing their belief in God and their mental health. I mean, so now 21% of millennials describe their mental and emotional health as either poor or only fair, while 36%, almost a third, uh, or basically a third of Generation Z describes their mental and emotional health as either poor or only fair. Uh, so this, this is a major crisis, okay? I think it's also a major opportunity for the church to be sharing hope and the gospel with these kids, all right? So we need to be very strategic in looking ahead. I think, how do we help folks that are struggling with these mental health issues and show them that the ultimate solution to that is, is in Christ, all right? So we need to be thinking strategically how to do that. That's a huge mission field right now. Okay, so a couple more questions. So what do you make of the fact that the Bible predicts a period uh, when people will fall away from their faith, what do you make of the statistics, these new statistics from Pew? And which of the reasons do you find that most of your friends or family who have left the church uh, have left the faith? W where would you typically put them in these four different categories? Okay, so let's take a few minutes to answer those questions.
so is this a, a, a new phenomena or has this happened in the past based on, based on the scripture? It's, it's happened throughout Christianity, hasn't it? All right. So in some regards, you know, we can, we can look at those statistics and those is horrible. The world's coming to an end, which it is coming to an end. But, uh, <laughs> but we do have the assurance that God's in control, don't we? And that uh, he's sovereignly at work. Um, what do you make of those other statistics I gave you? Were those also somewhat sobering? Mm -hmm. That's the reason why other countries are sending missionaries here. That's true. There are, there are other countries, you know, that are sending missionaries to America. Uh, yeah, Korea in particular. Uh, so just out of curiosity, what, what type of, how would you characterize some of the folks that you know uh, that have locked, walked away from their faith? Is it be, or would you characterize them as consumer sheep, casual sheep, cognitive, or cultural sheep? Casualty? How, how many casualties out there? Just okay. A lot of consumer, a lot of consumer sheep. Christians. Okay. All right. How about cognitive sheep? Any cognitive sheep? Okay. All right. I see that a lot at UK. Uh, and then cultural sheep. They, they, okay. Yeah, that looks like there's a majority of cultural sheep. I've seen that a lot. It gets back to uh, kids start interacting with, with other folks, and uh, there's somebody that says they're an atheist, uh, but it's like, well, this is a pretty nice person. Uh, I didn't expect that, all right? Or they become friends with that person, and it's like they start taking up their offense almost in some cases. Uh, I've seen a lot. So, uh, so there are various reasons. The reason I differentiated those is, we think strategically, be how do we reach that individual? We need to kind of know where they're coming from, what, what's been sort of the, the critical issue that, that's caused them to leave the church and, and try to address that issue as we try to lead them back to Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right, so let's, let's go on. So let me try to define what we mean by faith deconstruction. I've used that term. So there are several def definitions we could look at. One of those is the process of dismantling or rejecting one's accepted faith or beliefs. Uh, in some essence, this is kind of a consequence of postmodernism. Uh, one of the elements of postmodernism is the whole concept of deconstruction, uh, which is a philosophy that you should look at any cluth claim, any cluth claim, uh, such as the Bible and basically break it down into pieces and see how it's basically untrue or how it's oppressing certain elements of the population, how we can go back and change that oppression. We've seen that work out pragmatically in the whole concept of critical theory. Uh, you've probably heard of critical race theory, but that's just one component of this broader philosophy that says we need to basically go and tear everything down and start from scratch because the system that was built has inherent biases in it, and in order to have a truly equitable system uh, or, or society, we've got to go back and start from scratch. So when we think about faith deconstruction, when we think about the whole concept of faith, I would suggest to you that faith really has three critical elements. One is a, a, a volitional component, a cognitive component, and an effective component. There is a head issue with regard to faith, there is a heart issue, and there's also a, a, a component of our will. You have to have all three of those to really be active uh, Christian faith. And a lot of times what happens is uh, people's foundation of faith may be flawed or they really only may have really one of these components. Sometimes I run into people I would kind of call cognitive Christians. There is no effective element. Uh, there's no uh, translation of that into the way they, they live or behave, all right? And that's really not a true Christian. And so if somebody attacks an element of their cognitive beliefs, their whole faith gets destroyed uh, as a consequence of that, okay? Uh, or we start looking at some of the relational issues and so on, that can sort of undermine the effective element of it and so on, okay? So first of all, Christian faith is based on those. So faith deconstruction is normally associated with a deficiency of one of these three elements here. Uh, that eventually uh, spreads to the other and then that results in a total collapse. Uh, and some of these deficiencies are associated with a faith that's just built on a, 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 a bad foundation, okay? So some people's faith is built on what their parents believe. That's not to say that what their parents believe was wrong or untrue, but they've never really appropriated that faith as their own faith, okay? 
Uh, and so maybe they, they, they've been going to church to get their parents' approval, but with that, once they're out of church, they, they just basically abandon that. Uh, or peer pressure and acceptance, uh, trying to follow rules, guilt, or fear, or really some folks just have this, uh, have developed a self-righteousness based on their performance of going to church and things like that. And so uh, when these get uh, basically undermined, the, the whole faith structure can fall apart. Okay. So we think of Jesus kind of giving an analogy to this when he talks about what are you going to build your faith on? It's going to be built on him or the rock or, or a, a basically a, a foundation built on sand. And when the storm comes, remember he says, the house that's built on the rock will stand. The house that's built on, on sand uh, will fall. Okay. Uh, here's a quote by uh, an early Puritan writer, Henry Scoggle, uh, from a book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man, that I think captures the essence of what true Christianity is and what is lacking a lot of these folks that, that have walked away from their faith. He says, a Christian is a person whose love of Christ is manifested in a delightful and affectionate sense of his character and his divine perfections, which makes the soul resign and sacrifice itself wholly unto him, desiring above all things to please him and delighting in nothing so much as in fellowship and communion with him and being ready to do or suffer anything for his sake or for his pleasure. Uh, I don't think a lot of people I run into, that's really their concept of Christianity. Uh, it's either some cognitive thing or it's obeying a bunch of laws. It's really not seeing Christ as your ultimate treasure, the most important thing uh, that you're totally in love with uh, that's directing and guiding your life. And so if we, can get, if we can have people understand that's what Christianity is and help them understand what that relationship looks like, uh, I think you'll avoid a lot of what we were seeing. So this process of deconstruction is not new. We see it played out, I think, explicitly in Genesis 3. And so there's several steps that Satan takes Adam and Eve through, basically deconstructing uh, their faith or trust in God. Uh, and we see the consequences of that. And so that's in your notes. Uh, and then there's some characteristics of deconstructionist. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize they all are image bearers. So Everybody that we're running into that, that's walking away from their faith is, a, is an image bearer that is, has value in, in the sight of God that we should be motivated to reach. Uh, and then folks are either seekers of God or they're seekers of their self. So they're seeking something. Uh, all of us are sinners. A lot of folks uh, that are responding by walking away from their faith are reacting to uh, external sins that have been committed against them or their own internal sins. Uh, they also are suppressing the truth Paul talks about in Romans 1. And as we've already looked at, they're also being held captive. Uh, so just to get a flavor of some of the types of uh, examples of this, this concept of deconstruction, here's some quotes for some former quote-unquote Christians uh, and the things that they're saying about their, their current status. Uh, so Josh Harris, I think most everybody knows who that is. Red, Red and Link were some uh, Christian uh, comedians that started with Campus Crusade, were very popular. They both now have claimed they're no longer Christians. Uh, Marty Sampson with Hillsong. Uh, John Piper's son, uh, Abraham Piper, has walked away from his, his faith. Uh, Paul Maxwell used to be a, an author and creator to Desiring God, which is an organization with John Piper. John Steigert with the uh, Christian band Hawk Nelson, Derek Webb with uh, Cademan's Call, and uh, Kevin Mack with DC Talk. All of these folks now claim that they're no longer Christians and they've walked away from their faith, all right? And again, it makes me wonder, based on that quote I just gave you, if that was really how, they, how their, their Christian experience could be described or there's something else going on here, okay? So we've talked briefly about general deconstruction. What about evangelicals? First, what is an evangelical? Uh, when you looked at those statistics I gave, you, might, you may wonder, <laughs> were they really interviewing evangelicals or, or, or what? Uh, but historically, these are some of the types of characteristics of people that would call themselves evangelical, uh, have a strong belief uh, in the Bible, the centrality of the cross and the gospel message, the need for a personal conversion, uh, the need to do evangelism, uh, the need to engage our culture, 
uh, and typically biblical roles of, of gender in the family and church. Those historically have been what would be characterized as an evangelical. Someone had a survey and said, I believe all those that would typically be characterized as an evangelical. It's interesting if you look at a map of evangelicals in the United States. Uh, this is, I think, from 2020. Uh, most of those are kind of clustered down in the southeastern part of the United States, uh, which I don't think surprises us. Uh, and that's been pretty consistent uh, since, since the 50s. Uh, but there's also another movement out there that's not just uh, uh, basically faith deconstruction, but it's actually abandoning evangelicalism. There's actually uh, a, 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 a hashtag uh, ex-evangelical. This is a term that was, was coined by a guy by the name of Blake Chaston in 2016 to try to make a quote-unquote safe place for those that were abused by evangelicals. There's now several podcasts out there that are promoting this viewpoint. And what he says evangelicals are leaving behind are, are these basic tenets, a literal reading of the Bible, belief that wives should be submissive to their husbands, a rejection of homosexuality as sin, uh, belief that capitalism is a better economic system than socialism, and identification uh, in association with social and political conservatism. So we're going to be talking about some of that stuff a little later on. Uh, here are some other examples of, of people that said they were evangelicals. These are off of hashtags. Uh, and again, that's in your notes. You can kind of go back and look at that. Just some of the comments are, are just uh, make me shudder. Uh, uh, some of the things that, that they're putting out there on the Internet. Uh, but again, you can start to see the flavor of, of what's going on in these people's minds and their hearts with regard to their... Uh, perspective not only about evangelicalism but but God as well. One of the problems I think with deconstructionists is they frequently try to explain why something with Christianity is wrong before they actually show that something is wrong. Uh, we see this all the time in our culture and the media. Uh, uh, basically the strategy is they try to identify a problem in society uh, that they show in the past the church may have endorsed this or supported this and so therefore uh, the church is now basically guilty of this, and so we, we've got to abandon this institution because of all the harm it's done, okay? So we must remember the validity of a theological argument is no longer based on whether it's true, but whether it, that belief has been used in the past to oppress people. Again, we're seeing the influence of Marxism and critical theory start to filter in to some of that. And so deconstructionism is now really not about uh, is about undermining perceived oppression and not falsifying truth claims. That's why, as I talked about, the whole challenge of whether Christianity is true or not is no longer, in many cases, really focused on. It's whether Christianity is good or beautiful, and that's pivoting on these, these types of issues here. So it's important to understand when we're looking at, at uh, interacting with some folks. Um, just as an example... Here's a quote from a, a book, Why Faith Deconstruction Won't Go Away, uh, related to this issue. It says, the only way to create an equitable religious community is to correct the imbalance of power that currently exists and is threatening those who benefit from the existing system. People are hurting right now. Much of that harm is done by a church with doctrines rooted in colonialism, white supremacy, and gender bias. Okay, So those are the... the concepts are then really being used as a motivation. Well, you can't, we can't be associated with this institution because it's inherently systemically biased. Yes? So is there like a different term that someone could use that's not deconstructionism that like if you're questioning some of those things? Like, so like I grew up in a church that just to, like women were taught like different things than men. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now I have to examine that as, you know, a child of God and mm -hmm. like what my, but I'm not really like. No, no, I think I, that's a great, that's a great question. So I think all of us are continually evaluating uh, what our beliefs are, but we should be evaluating them in the context of what God's word says, right? Okay. Not what this pastor told us, not what some churches told us. All right. And so as evangelicals, ultimately, we, we base our truth claims on God's word as, as interpreted by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, all right? Uh, certainly, we, we, we are under leadership with regard to guidance, but, but we shouldn't hold 
religious leaders is infallible, okay? And we have to admit, just historically, there's been a lot of abuse done in churches by those types of situations and by those types of individuals, okay? The, 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 you, we, you have to be careful. I think, you know, a classic um, saying is throwing out the baby with the bathwater, okay? So, uh, but, so I think it, there's always this reevaluation of our faith uh, as the Holy Spirit is always helping us refine our faith. That's the process of sanctification as well, right? So, does that help? Yes. Okay. Okay, so what are some of the consequences of re rejecting Jesus? Uh, if we look at Romans 1, Paul lays out a pretty stark uh, process that, that goes about. People embrace godliness, which is really a heart issue. They then in, in practice un unrighteousness, which is a behavior, a will issue, which leads to a suppression of the truth. Uh, then there's these, these different uh, steps here. They refuse to acknowledge God. They refuse to honor God. They refuse to thank God. And they replace God with idol. And then there's a, a very serious step of consequences. First, their futile becomes, or their thinking becomes futile. Their hearts become darkened. Their conscience becomes seared. Their will becomes captive. And ultimately, their thirst remains unquenched, which is really a description of hell, is, is it not? Okay. Uh, you think about Jesus said, you know, I am, I am the, basically, uh, the, the true, true water. Uh, come to me and you will be refreshed. I think back to this passage in Jeremiah where it says, Be appalled, O heavens, and shocked at this. Be utter desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves that cannot hold water. Does that not describe our culture today? Okay. Uh, and so what is, the, what is the consequence of this? Uh, this is a, one of the most sobering passages in the Bible in Hebrews 10, where, where the writer of Hebrews says, if you've been exposed to the truth and you reject it, all right, then there's, there's no hope for you. Uh, there's a severe judgment that's coming upon you. Uh, and if, if you really want to get a flavor of the, the magnitude of that passage, uh, has anybody heard of Jonathan Edwards in here before? Okay. Jonathan Edwards was uh, a, a Puritan pastor back in the 1700s. Uh, he's written a lot of f fantastic uh, essays and books. He was considered probably the, the smartest, even, uh, smartest person in America, quite frankly. Uh, but there's two essays uh, that he gave, or two, excuse me, sermons that he gave. One of, one of those is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You may have heard of that one. Uh, he has another one called The Future Punishment of the World, Unavoidable and Intolerable. Uh, if you sign up on the email list, I'll send those out to you. Those are the two of the most sobering things I've ever read in my entire life. It is said he was a very monotone preacher when he preached this sermon on July 8th, 19, or 1741. Before he finished his sermon, people were shrieking and running down the aisles to the altar to be saved. Uh, that's how powerful this sermon was. Uh, and so it, it's not for the lighthearted, uh, but it's very sobering to read, to think about this, this is the fate of your, of your friends and loved ones that don't know Christ, and hopefully that will motivate you to, to get more serious about reaching them. And so a biblical response, how do we respond to this? We're told, uh, are told in 2 Corinthians by Paul that we're obviously ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to be making our appeal uh, to on his behalf, three, three motivations. We know what to fear the Lord is. And if, if you question that, I, I, I recommend you go and read uh, Edward's uh, sermons. But also the love of Christ is controlling us. We love people, so we want to see them come to uh, a truth of the gospel. And finally, we, we no longer regard people according to the flesh. And let me close with one last quote. This is from C.S. Lewis uh, in one of his essays. The weight of glory, he says, It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting, uninteresting person you talk to, one may uh, talk to one day may be a creature which, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a whore and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one of these two destinations. It is, light of, it is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all our friendships, all our loves, all our play, all our politics. There are no ordinary people. 
You have never met a mere mortal. It is immortals with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal whores or everlasting splendors. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object you will ever encounter in this world. If he is your Christian neighbor, then he is almost in every way, he is ho then he is holy in almost the same way, for in him Christ lives today. Hopefully that'll just, again, think about the person that you're going through the checkout liner that's waiting on you. Those are immortal people. They're going to live forever, okay, in one state or the other. And we have a chance to point them to the truth, which will hopefully motivate us to, to do so. Okay, so I knew I'd never get through all this material, but we almost did. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, if you haven't turned in your survey, do it on the way out. Uh, make sure you sign up uh, the, the list with your email. If you do that, I'll send you all the materials that we went over today as well as those for next week. And then try to drop a few things uh, in, in your email this week. All right, so let me close real quick with the word of prayer. Dear God, just thank you for this time together. Lord, just uh, most importantly, help us to develop a greater heart and passion for reaching our friends uh, that don't know you, Lord. And as we work through this material, uh, help us to apply it to be more effective in doing so. Just be with this week, Lord. I just pray for each family, each individual here that has a lost loved one, uh, that you might start to work in their heart and, and uh, uh, use the folks here in this room to reach them with the gospel. We just pray, praise you for all your, your blessings and just uh, ask you to be with us this week. In Christ's name, amen.